We don't like to be disillusioned, do we? When I say I'm disillusioned with someone or something, I mean that negatively, don't I? But actually we should mean it positively. It's a good thing to be disillusioned, to have my illusions revealed to me and taken away. Otherwise I'm saying I like my illusions. I don't want to know the truth. But Jesus said the truth will set us free. The Enneagram is also known as the Nine Illusions. It's a tool for revealing to us the things that we believe and we act by that aren't true and just don't work. It's also a tool, a study of sin, to reveal to us our hidden sins. It's the very nature of sin to hide itself. That's why Satan is called the deceiver. And the psalmist prays, search me, O God, see if there be some hidden way in me. Our sins are naturally hidden from us, and the Enneagram is a tool to help us. But really, unless we have the help of the Spirit, we don't recognize our own sins. And so nine personality types, nine besetting sins, nine illusions. Now remember, I can't change my personality type. That was set way back when I was very young. But what I can do is bring it to Christ to be redeemed. Remember that every one of the nine is ugly when they're unredeemed, what the Bible calls in the flesh. Every one of them is wonderful when they're redeemed, what the Bible calls in the spirit. And each type can bring gifts to the world that none of the others can bring. Let's remind ourselves of what we saw last time. We looked at the perfectionist, the mosquito, buzzing around our heads saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're not good enough, you're not good enough. But when they are redeemed, they become very good people and they have a better understanding of failings than anybody else. And then there was the number two, the caregiver, the cat, cuddly and warm and purring on your lap. But be careful, they have claws if you don't appreciate me. But when they are redeemed, they become wonderful caregivers. If you're being looked after by a number two, you're a very lucky person. And then the number three, the achiever, the chameleon, willing to change his appearance to suit his circumstances. And so what you see is not always what you get. But when they are redeemed, they really do achieve things. People follow them and they have an unshakable sense of integrity. And so we move on now to the number four, the artist. The illusion of the number four is if only I can be special, everything will be okay and people won't reject me. They're very afraid of being ordinary. They have to be different and they really are different. You just have to walk into the bedroom of a number four and you will know this is a number four's bedroom. They are often creative and generally unconventional. They don't easily fit into structures. Their besetting sin is envy. They cannot bear it if someone is more special than they are. And so they are very prone to want to be different. They're also prone to self-absorption, even depression. And they can be quite aloof because in their opinion, no one is quite as special as they are. And they really struggle to fit into structures, which is not a sin in itself, but it can lead to their writing people off. They can really look down on people who like structures. When a number four is redeemed, they bring originality, insight, sensitivity like no other kind can. And they challenge structures, which is really important. The world needs that badly because structures can be as sinful as people. They understand human emotions better than anyone else. And they celebrate differentness. They are the French of this world. Vive la différence. And when they redeem, they can use their depression as a catalyst to help them to produce a message for the world. And they are especially good at producing symbols and imagery, which are often more important than words. They are not necessarily literally artists, but one way or another they produce symbols that enrich the world around them. 
The animal for the number four is the morning dove. Beautiful and sleek, but sitting up in his tree, cooing away to himself, I'm so sad, I'm so sad, no one's ever been sad quite the way that I'm sad. But when they're redeemed, they use their sadness to produce symbolism that is very beautiful and meaningful to those around them. Now, which of the ten gospel characters do you think is the number four? I'm going to show you one that's truly redeemed. If you want to work this out for yourself, pause the video now. Now, you may have been wondering why I've got ten characters for nine personality types. That's just to make it a little more interesting. One of the nine types is represented twice on our list. The gospel character that represents the number four is Mary, the sister of Martha. Luke 10, a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at Jesus' feet listening to what he said. Jesus said, Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken from her. Notice that she sits at Jesus' feet. At their best, that's what the artist does. He drinks in, she drinks in. Notice the listening. They take in, they take in emotionally, they take in the whole concept. And Jesus commends that. He says they've chosen what is better. She takes it in and later she will produce some wonderful symbolism. In chapter 11, when Lazarus has died, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. That's typical of the number four. The dove sits in its tree, cooing, I'm so sad, I'm so sad. And there's nothing wrong with her sadness here. Her brother has died. Then later, Mary does rush out to see Jesus. And when the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to mourn there. They knew Mary. She was likely to go to the tomb. She was going to increase her grief. She was going, as it were, to press on the thorn and feel her pain. That's the number four. And then she meets Jesus. And when he saw her weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Notice that Jesus knows how to deal with the four. You get down in with their emotion and you feel it with them. Where have you laid him? He asked. There it is again. Let's go to the place of pain and I'll feel your pain with you. Fours need that. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Jesus fully engaging with this number four. And then in, after Lazarus is raised from the dead and a dinner is given, Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Here is the redeemed number four, creating magnificent imagery. Notice she took expensive perfume. She doesn't count the cost. Number fours, when they're redeemed, don't count the cost. They give from the depth of their hearts. She poured it on Jesus' feet. Notice the generosity, the full-heartedness of that. Martha would have measured it out with a teaspoon, but not the redeemed number four. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Redeemed number fours have an ability to bring a sweet fragrance to a dirty world. And so Mary produces this wonderful symbolism. The picture of Mary anointing Jesus' feet and then drying them with her hair has endured down the centuries as the great picture of what it means truly to love Jesus. Now we move on to number five, the observer. The illusion of the number five is if only I can know and perceive, then everything will be okay and people won't reject me. So they retreat also into their tree, but not like the number four. They are looking for information. They are very cerebral. They're afraid of emotional engagement. At their funniest, they become the absent-minded professor. At their worst, they sit in their ivory towers, dispensing decisions without taking trouble to find out what effect their decisions will have on ordinary people. They don't easily engage. Their besetting sin is stinginess, not so much with money, but stingy in sharing themselves. They can be aloof and they can lack empathy. And they are frequently 
uncomfortable with physical displays of intimacy. If you hug a number five, sometimes it's like hugging a board. But when redeemed, they, like everyone else, offer wonderful gifts, the gift of wisdom. They often are able to see into the nub of the problem. And they make very good arbitrators because they stay emotionally detached and they see both sides of a problem. And once committed, they become very brave and determined. The animal for the number five is the owl sitting up in his tree observing everything below with his big eyes and his big ears but not getting involved. I was once in a canoe sitting under a tree and looking around. I'd been there for some time when I looked straight above me and not six feet above me was an eagle owl looking down on me with his big yellow eyes but the minute I caught his eye he flew away. That's the observer. They watch but they don't want to get involved. And so back to our 10 characters. Which one do you think is the observer? If you want to work that out for yourself, pause the video now. The character in the Gospel that is a number five is Thomas. Now we're only ever told four things that Thomas said. And the first three of them are all to do with skepticism, a struggle to believe, a struggle to engage and commit, like the owl sitting up in the tree. Firstly, in John 11, when Jesus told them plainly Lazarus is dead, Thomas said, let us go that we may die with him. There's the non-committal, the non-faith. He can't believe and he won't commit. In John 14, where Jesus wonderfully says to them, I go to prepare a place for you, Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. There it is again, the skepticism. We don't know. Notice the importance for him of knowing. And then in John 20, Jesus appears on that first Sunday after his resurrection to the other disciples. And we read, Thomas was not with the disciples. Why is he not with them? Well, because he's a number five. He tends to withdraw and he goes into some room quietly on his own to try and work it all out in his head. And some things can't be worked out in his head. When we don't engage with other people, we often lose and we miss out. The other disciples said, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, this is the third time Thomas speaks, but he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. There's the professor who needs the evidence, otherwise he will remain skeptical. It's almost a decision to remain skeptical, isn't it? And then Jesus appears a week later Thomas is left in limbo for a whole week because he didn't engage. And Jesus says to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand, put it into my side. This is how Jesus deals with the number five. He says, you must engage, you must touch, you mustn't sit aloof in your tree. But Thomas gets redeemed. Once he sees the risen Lord Jesus Christ, he falls on his knees and says the most important words in the Gospel of John, my Lord and my God. Those words have been called the manifesto of the Christian church. And he's now committed and he stays committed for life. We believe he went to India and he shared the Gospel there and paid for it with his life. And now we move on to the number six, the loyal soldier. The illusion of the number six is, if only I can be loyal and obedient, then everything will be okay and people won't reject me. Number sixes are afraid of uncertainty. They're always looking for something external that can be an authority for them, something that they can hitch themselves to. Their besetting sin is fear. Now fear in itself is not a sin, but for a six it can become a sin because it dominates their lives. This fear can lead them to unthinking obedience, which is a kind of moral laziness. They can also become fanatical and dogmatic in following their leader or their ideology. Sometimes sixes are timid, but other times they overcompensate. They become full of bravado and make rash promises in order to cover their fear. And they can be cruel in protecting their beliefs or in obeying orders. 
And this was the excuse given by many soldiers as they carried out the Holocaust. I was just obeying orders. When they are redeemed, they bring wonderful gifts, loyalty, obedience, responsibility, and trust. The animal for the number six is the hare. Just look at those enormous ears, just ready to pick up trouble so they can get away at the first sign of danger. And look at those enormous hind legs, ready to jump and get away as fast as possible. Or if danger gets too close, to give you a mighty kick. That's the unredeemed number six. And now which of our ten gospel characters do you think is the number six? I'll give you a clue. He's the kind of number six that's full of bravado and acting out to hide his fear. If you want to look at that for yourself, pause the video now. The character in the Gospels that is a number six is Simon Peter. And Peter is that kind of sixth that covers his fear with bravado and rash promises. In John 13, Peter asked, Lord, can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. There's the rash promise. Jesus answered before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. There is the knowledge of Peter's fear. In John 18, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Simon Peter drew his sword and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Now there's the bravado, but notice the cowardice with it. He doesn't attack one of the soldiers. He attacks the high priest's servant. And think of this, why did he cut off his right ear? If he was standing face to face, he would more naturally cut off his left ear, wouldn't he? I think he was standing behind the servant, took, took a swing at him and cut off his right ear. It's basically an act of cowardice. And then later in the chapter, of course, aren't you one of the man's disciples? The servant girl asked Peter. I am not, Peter replied. And he added a swear word. There's also the bravado of the number six. But he denied to a servant girl. Such was the level of his inner fear. But there's a story in Matthew 17 that really reveals the inner fear of Peter. It's a story that's not often understood. The collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and asked, Doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. Now notice this. These are minor tax collectors. They're not even Roman tax collectors. They are minor officials, and yet Peter folds in front of them because when he says, yes, he does, he's telling a lie. Jesus doesn't. But Peter is so torn and twisted about it that Jesus says, so that we may not cause offense, go to the lake, throw out your line, take the first fish you catch, and open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. And so Jesus actually performs a miracle so that Peter can get out of his self-induced dilemma. It's wonderful to see how Jesus bends to our personality type and slowly brings us out. But Peter gets redeemed. Right at the beginning, Jesus said, I no longer call you Simon, I will call you Peter, which means a rock. Nothing could have been less true of him at the time, but Jesus sees what he will become, and he becomes a rock who would never run away from danger again. Look what he says to his followers in his epistle later on. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Rejoice that you've been chosen to share in the sufferings of Christ. Peter no longer runs away. He faces it for the sake of Jesus. And so he's no longer the hare. He's the Labrador, utterly loyal and trustworthy. And so we've looked at four, five and six. The six always looking for a structure to keep them safe. The four always suspicious of structures, even regarding structures as an enemy of the human spirit. And the five hovering over them all, evaluating but not getting committed. Those three are not going to make easy dinner guests. Next time we look at 7, 8 and 9.